Good morning, Bridgeway. How is everybody out there? Thanks for braving the rain and coming on in this morning. If you're watching online, welcome this morning as well to our worship. We're going to start as we normally do with some singing. So would you stand up? As we start with an old hymn, it is well. Oh, sound 
have a seat for just a moment. I want to have Miss Rachel come on up for some announcements. Good morning, everyone. So if you are new here, there is a QR code on the back of your chair or um, in these little pamphlets here um, that you can scan and just fill out some information. Um, we donate $10 to a Child's Hope International for every communication card that a guest fills out and $10 feeds a child for an entire month. And then we still have the diaper drive for Joel and Meg Ring. Um, you can leave the diapers at the guest service table for them. And the marriage small group is starting up here soon that um, you can also sign up with the QR code or on the app um, to get more information on that. That'll be at 9.15 before service. And then the decorate and do good, those are still going on. Um, there's a code for um, a discount when you enter those in. Um, it's, the code is Bernie. And then you can list in the notes section which pumpkin that you would like there. They're numbered like one through four, what they are on there. And then um, Bridgeway Bible Club Bonfire, that will be at Brian and Sarah Cunningham's house on Saturday, October 5th at 6.30 p.m. So if you need any information on that, um, there's also a Facebook page that has info on that. If you're not on there, just reach out to Brian or Sarah. And then we have um, a youth revival. It's called Unshaken. This is for middle school and high school students, um, October 18th and 19th, so a Friday and Saturday. It's only $15 for both days. Um, there is a link that has all the information. I have a QR code. If you guys wanna check that out after service, just find me. Um, there's free pizza, all kinds of things with the $15 for both days. So it ends Saturday at 4 p.m., by the way. And then Bridgeway Fall Family Festival, that is Saturday, October 26th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, it's preschool through fifth grade, but all family invited. Um, food, games, and that is by Tommy and Aaron Webb. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to them as well. And that's it. So we'll close in prayer and we'll get back to worship. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, I thank you for just being with us um, here at Bridgeway. We ask that you guide us throughout this week to give us wisdom and knowledge. Um, just let us please be good disciples of your word, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand as we continue our worship?
Amen. <laughs> I left the other bottle from last week in there. <laughs> Let's just put that over there. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. My name is Brent. If I haven't met you yet, uh, I, I got a couple things before we get into the Word today. We're going to kind of be in John. We've been doing a series through the Gospel of John, uh, but we're going to kind of hit the brakes just a little bit today. Uh, next week, um, Andrew Cole, Deacon Cole, if you put your hand up, please. That's Andrew. Uh, he's going to be bringing a message on marriage, leading into a small group that he's going to be leading along with his wife, Christy, uh, in the, the weeks after that. So we're looking forward to that. Well, on the back of your bulletin, there's a couple service opportunities in uh, November I want to give you a heads up on. One is a Child's Hope International. Uh, if you have never been, it's a great experience. It's a place where we pack food that gets shipped all over the world. And so if you want to sign up to volunteer uh, to serve, I would do that sooner than later. They fill up pretty quick. And so there's QR codes there. And then we're going to be doing a Thanksgiving dinner at Sunrise Manor Nursing Home this year. Uh, we're going to actually be doing pasta from Olive Garden because it's, it's easier for them to eat, you know. And so we're going to have a little Thanksgiving dinner. It's at noon. I know it's during the day. A lot of you will be at work. But if you're free that day and you would like to help serve, you know, just, uh, just let us know. And then uh, this fall, we're going to have a new uh, service set up, a uh, new service layout. <clears throat> uh, service is going to be about 15 minutes longer. No, I'm not preaching 15 minutes more. It's, oh, <laughs> that was Deacon Cole, too, who's preaching next Sunday. So <laughs> I'm watching you, man. Um, <clears throat> we're going to add a couple different elements to the, our worship time together uh, that I believe... Um, we need to do as a church. Uh, the first one will be uh, at the beginning of each service, we're going to have a call to worship. And what that means is basically we'll read most likely something from the hymns, uh, from, from the Psalms rather, um, pointing people to the glory of the Lord. <clears throat> and so that'll be what opens our service. We'll read it and then we'll say it together uh, collectively as a faith family. And uh, my hope, what I'd love to do, I would love to have our students uh, or our kids be the ones to lead that, that portion of that. Um, so parents, I'll be reaching out to you. We'll have the same call to worship for an entire month. And so um, I'll be touching base with you. We'd love to get them involved, get them on stage, reading some scripture. So then at the end of service, um, the Lord really pressed on me to have some, something of a response time. Um, Typically, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'll hang out after service. Pastor Brandon will hang out after service. If someone wants to come talk to us, they're welcome to do so. Um, but I feel we need to do something a little more than that. Um, so what we're going to start doing um, is, one, we're going to have a prayer team that will be up here. If you need prayer and you want someone to pray with you, or if you have questions about the faith, they'll be available to talk to you. But we're also going to have com uh, communion each Sunday. Uh, it's something new for us, something we typically do uh, quarterly, and we want to, to make this uh, a regular thing, because communion, uh, one, it, it's, it's a way for us to remember the, the, the death of our Savior. It's also a realignment for us as Christians. Um, so it really challenges us to examine ourselves, and uh, I think that's needed each week. I don't think uh, that's something where we're going to take it for granted, like, oh, we're doing this again. You know, we sing every Sunday at church, and that, that never gets old. And so I think this would be an important time for Christians, you know, to, to respond to the Lord. And then we'll have, you know, people that can pray with folks. And so uh, then we'll end the service uh, with a song like we normally do. So something that uh, we wanted to add on to our service time. And so it will be about 15 minutes longer. I've already talked to our children's department. They're all in favor of it, um, <laughs> I think. But uh, uh, I'm excited about that. And so that'll be coming up in November, okay? It's when we're going to make that change. So, all right. Well, let's go to our, our text today. You're actually going to be looking in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to revisit something we talked about a couple years ago when we walked through the book of Ecclesiastes. But let's go ahead and read our opening text. Oh, we have Bibles if you need them. Just throw your hand up in the air, and uh, Mark can get you a Bible. But let's go ahead and read our opening text for the Gospel of John, if you could bring that up, please. Uh, so let's read this together. John 20, 30. This is what we read every week, the purpose of John's gospel. Uh, together, let's read. Uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Next verse, please. 
But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And again, that is the purpose for which this gospel is written, this biography of Jesus. The Bible is not an exhaustive book on everything. It's a book so we can come to know the Lord. Last week, we we dove into John chapter 8. We are on verses 21 through 30. And Jesus, right away, he's drawing a line in the sand uh, before these Jewish leaders. He said in verse 21, uh, John 8, 21, then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me. You will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And so Jesus is very blunt with these guys. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in depth um, in, in a couple of weeks. But later on in, in verse 24, he, he gives them a little bit of hope because he says, you know, if you don't believe that I'm Messiah, you're going to die in your sin. Like, this is a real thing. So last week we talked about that, how one of the most loving things you can do is to tell someone the truth, even if that truth might be hard for them to hear. And so we started also talking about keeping life with an eternal perspective, thinking about, okay, what comes next? And uh, I believe the Lord pressed upon me to, to visit something that we talked about a few years ago in Ecclesiastes 1 in dealing with the purpose of this life and how we should view life. Um, so we're going to do that today in light of this passage, and then we'll get back to, to the Gospel of John in a couple of weeks. But we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 1. I'm going to read our text, then we'll break it down, okay? And if you're not familiar with Ecclesiastes, uh, it's, it's a book of wisdom, uh, but it, 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 we're learning from someone's mistake. We're learning from their foolishness. And this is, of course, King Solomon, uh, we believe, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And so uh, let's see what he has to say. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, absolute futility, says the teacher, absolute futility, everything is futile. What does a person gain for all of his efforts that he labors at under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets, panting, it hurries back to the place where it rises. He turned me down a little bit, Mark, and get some ringing. Gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning, goes the wind, and the wind returns in its cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. The place, to the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled by hearing. (laughs) What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. If you're going to underline anything in that, that text, that's That's a a saying to underline because it shows up a lot in that book. Can one say about anything, look, this is new. It has already existed in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of those who came before and of those who will come after. There will also be no remembrance by those who follow them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for our time together to gather and to worship you, to sing, and uh, now to respond to your word, Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds are open to what you're saying to us, that your spirit would convict and teach. I pray for those who are far from you, God, that maybe this can help them take steps in the right direction. I pray for those who don't know you, Lord, that today could be eternity changing for them. We love you. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Solomon in this book, and, and I'm if you want to have an in-depth study in this book, just go to our, our webpage. We did, uh, I think, like 20 weeks on the book of Ecclesiastes. But Solomon is trying to answer a question in this book. And the book is, the question is, is there any purpose in this life apart from God? And he's going to look at this from an entirely human perspective. So some of his conclusions in his book are wrong. Um, Because we're told, you know, to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. And so he's going to look at this life from that uh, perspective. And he's he's uniquely qualified to do so, because if you don't know who Solomon is, um, he's, at this point, he's king. He's the richest man around, and he goes through a series of tests throughout this book. Uh, It's kind of like he's 
if, as if he were sitting down giving uh, some young men some advice. Is kind of how it is. He's like, learn from my mistakes. He tries to, he tries to find purpose and power, and it doesn't, doesn't work for him. He tries to find purpose in his work. It doesn't work for him. He tries to find purpose in uh, his flesh and his, his sexual desires. It doesn't work for him. He tries to find it in money. It doesn't work for him. He tries all of these things, and he, as he just read, starts the book saying, absolute futility, absolute emptiness is what he's saying. It's vanity. He has this pursuit of happiness, which many people are pursuing. I mean, that's in our Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And mankind deals with that on a regular basis. If I only had blank, I would be happy. If I was only this, then I would be happy. If I only had this situation, job, house, friends, spouse, so on and so forth, people Many people live in a constant state of dissatisfaction in their life because they're chasing happiness. And happiness is a lousy goal. I like how one pastor put it, Skip uh, Hetzig said this, happiness isn't found by direct pursuit. Happiness is the byproduct of pursuing something else, actually someone else. When you pursue God, happiness becomes the byproduct. When you pursue happiness, you'll neither find happiness or God. And so many people live in a constant state of dissatisfaction. I am just not happy. And we can see this pretty uh, evident in in our culture today because we, we enjoy today a standard of living that mankind has never had, right? I think of my mammal king. Uh, she was born in 1899, died in the year 2000. I always found that to be quite fascinating. And I think of all the changes she experienced in her 100 years of life and how life was different when she was a kid and, and difficult in a lot of different respects. I mean, think of the comfort and the ease that we, we enjoy and we have that most people throughout antiquity never had. I mean, our accessibility to food and clean water and uh, housing and you got air conditioning. Like none of us here are fretting of whether or not we're going to have food today. It's what we're going to eat. We enjoy a, an immense uh, good standard of, of life. However, this better standard of living has not produced more happiness. In fact, uh, one study talks about how it's, it's eerie that it's synchronized, that the, the, the better life has gotten, that more people kept getting diagnosed with depression. As life collectively got better, we didn't get better. It's almost as if that pursuit of happiness and having all the things that we ever wanted wasn't actually fulfilling us. Today, I mean, we think of, of, of issues we have today, and in particular dealing with uh, our, our young, young folks and the issues that they, they face, which are quite challenging. More than, and this is a 2021 study, I mean, who knows what it is today, but more than four out of 10 students felt uh, persistently sad or hopeless. Four out of 10 had a persistent feeling of sadness or hopelessness. One in five have seriously considered attempting suicide. The, 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 the mental health of uh, the younger generation is, is not in a great state. Yet they don't, they don't have the challenges they had 150 years. Why is that? People have always had different challenges, but... I think if you are putting the purpose of your life in something that's not God, ultimately you're going to find it to be empty, an empty pursuit. And that's how Solomon describes it. Take a look back at verse one. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility, everything is futile. It's vanity. Uh, the Hebrew word is hebel, which means a breath or a breeze. 
it is a, a vapor, a, a puff of smoke that you can't just grasp. And that's how he's viewing life. I got some of these matches. I found them back there. I don't know how old they are. They have the presidents on them. Anybody remember those president matches? <laughs> we find all sorts of uh, older stuff from time to time in the building. Um, the other day I was trying to use some caulk on some flashing and uh, it wouldn't, you know, I, I cut it and I was trying to get all the, the caulk to come out and it wouldn't come out. I thought, okay, what am I doing wrong here? The caulk was from April of 2002 <laughs> before I graduated high school. So I don't even know if these matches will work, but let's give it a shot. Hey, it worked. All right. Uh, Solomon compares our life to a, a vapor or, or, or smoke or something that's there. And he, he's comparing life in a pursuit of happiness as if you could try to grab smoke and it's there and then it's gone. Now, when you're reading the book of Ecclesiastes, it can be kind of depressing if you don't you know, read the whole book. Like if you just stop in chapter one, it's not a great motivation, okay? Um, we're not gonna stop there. But the Ecclesiastes, as one pastor put it, Ecclesiastes is a meditation on how life seems to elude our grasp. Actually, let me back up to Psalm 39. I'll share that scripture with you. I shared it last week. I shared it at a funeral yesterday. And the reason I share this verse, I feel like this, this verse is always in front of me, personally speaking. In fact, you have made my days just inches long. My lifespan is as nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. Selah. And that Selah is a pause. Stop and think about what you just read is what it's saying to us. My life is but a vapor that's here and then it's gone. Back to the quote, Ecclesiastes is a meditation on how life seems to elude our grasp in terms of lasting significance. If we try to gain control of the world and our lives by what we can understand and by what we can do, we find that control we seek eludes us. And the older you get, you get, the more you realize how much isn't in your control. And so you've got a choice. You can try to control everything or you can trust <laughs> the one who ultimately is in control. Verse three, he says, what does a person gain for all of his efforts that he labors under the sun? It's like you get up, you go to work, repeat, get up, go to work, pay your bill. He, 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 he views life uh, as monotonous, this vicious cycle that he can't escape and like I said, this is a very pessimistic part of his journal. We're going to get to the good part, okay, eventually here today. But when we were going through the book of Ecclesiastes, it took us a while to get there. Solomon's not a great motivational speaker. He reminds me of, uh, you remember the old Geico commercial with Pinocchio? Where he, you know, how Pinocchio would make a terrible motivational speaker, like, you guys have talent, and his nose grows. I see potential, and his nose grows. It was like from 2004, kids. Look it up, check it out. You can try to find satisfaction in this life in so many things. Ultimately, they will fail you. Because you weren't created just to consume. You were created to worship the one who created you. So if you worship that which isn't God, ultimately it will fail you. It might seem great at first, but eventually it will fail you, no matter what that pursuit might be. If it is not ultimately to the Lord, it will fail you. C.S. Lewis put it this way in his, his book, Mere Christianity. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. I love that. If I cannot find satisfaction in anything in this world... The only logical conclusion is I was made for another one. And you were. That satisfaction is found in God. Verse 4, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. 385,000 people will be born today and 150,000 people will die. And then tomorrow the same thing will happen and tomorrow the same thing will happen generation will come and a generation will go. 
In verses 5 through 8, he matches a pattern in the world with the pattern of the human experience. Verse 5, the sun rises and sets. Panting, it hurries back to the place where it rises, gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning goes the wind, and the wind returns in its cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, more than any, anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing. We live in a constant pursuit in our society of fulfillment. Yet mankind's eyes will never be fully satisfied. Your ears will never be fully satisfied. So I catch ourselves continually scrolling on our phones. I'm guilty of that too. Just looking at another thing, at another thing, at another thing. Mankind wrestles with this. Thinks they can find fulfillment in the next best thing, but that's not where it's found. We have this intense fear of missing out. We don't want to miss out. We don't want to be left out. So we constantly search. If you're not familiar with C.S. Lewis or his works, I encourage you to get acquainted. One of his books that he wrote is called The Screwtape Letters. It started off as articles in a newspaper. But if you're not familiar with The Screwtape Letters, it's a fictional story about these demons trying to get this guy, which is called the patient, um, away from God, essentially. They're trying to trip this guy up in any way they can. And so screw tape is like this seasoned demon and Wormwood, it, Wormwood is his uh, apprentice, for lack of better terms. And so he's teaching this uh, Wormwood how to mess people up and how to trip people up. And one of the things he says in his uh, uh, this, in this fictional story, the advice he gives is he says this, the horror of the same old thing is one of the most valuable passions we have produced in the human heart. An endless source of heresies in religion, folly in counsel, infidelity in marriage, and inconstancy in friendship. Fear of the same old thing keeps us searching for the next best thing and the next best thing and the next best thing, yet it ultimately will never come. The eye is never satisfied, nor the ear. Verse 9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. I'm sure you've heard that before. This is where that saying comes from. There's nothing new under the sun. Can one say about anything, look, this is new? It has already existed before. It's kind of like how the trends, they come back. You know, there's more mullets and mom jeans than there were in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up. They're everywhere. It just kind of circles back around. So I can't wait until mullets and mom jeans, I guess, circle back around in 50 years or whenever they're supposed to. And if that's your style, you know, rock on. That's fine. You know, that was our style at some point. When I was a kid, we would wear the bike shorts. Anybody remember the bike shorts with neon colors? We had neon colors and windsuits. Anybody remember windsuits? Windsuits are going to make a comeback someday, all right? And they'll be like the noisiest church service we ever had with like half the people wearing windsuits. But you'll be cool, okay? He's like, hey, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, we have new technology, but the purpose is the same. You know, we're trying to communicate in different ways. Mankind struggles with some of the same things over and over again. And some think, well, Brent, we're much more enlightened than we used to be because look how advanced we are. Are we really that advanced, though? Uh, yep, technology, you could say we are, but has mankind really advanced? If you think we have, just... Have you ever heard of TikTok? Yeah. Is there advanced stuff on that? A lot of craziness, right? We, we, we might have newer technology, but mankind struggles and deals with a lot of the same issues. We think we're enlightened, but we're not as smart as we think we are. <laughs> Verse 11 is where it kind of gets 
a little more depressing. Again, I'm gonna bring, bring some light to this in just a second, but the reason I'm gonna bring this up is because Jesus in our text in John 8, he draws a line in the sand. Like, listen, where I'm going, you're not going right now because you're gonna die in your sin. You think this life is about you? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And he's making this point. He wants them to know that he is the Messiah. Verse 11, there's no remembrance of those who came before and there will be no remembrance um, of those who will come after. There will also be no remembrance by those who follow him. He's, he says, no one will remember you. I know this is a broad statement, but yeah, I mean, a uh, uh, hundred years from now, are people really going to know you? Maybe your grandkids. When we went out east, uh, our trip in New England, a few years back, um, my family's from Maine, the Cunninghams, and well, some of my family, of course, uh, from Maine, and we were able to track down, you know, my great grandfather's house and uh, the, the family graveyard. And so we found a gravestone of my great, 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 great grandfather, James Cunningham. He was born in, I think, 1780 something. And uh, that was pretty cool, you know? Like, hey, man, that's, that's where he's buried. They had a funeral there one day, and my family was there, and we have some roads named after us in the area, and it was pretty neat to see. But I don't know the guy. I know I'm related to him. And then I think, okay, yeah, that was, they didn't have the technology we have today, and, you know, I, I think 200 years from now, you, you can take me down, me and James, thank you. <laughs> Like, are my great-great-grandkids going to see this sermon? You know? Maybe they will. So, great-great-grandkids, um, if you're listening to this a long time from now, uh, one, uh, Papa loves you, and um, don't do anything stupid, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, but I think of that, too. They're going to maybe hear a, a, a sermon from me, but they, don't, they won't really know me, know me. I can't remember the missionary who said it, but he said uh, something to the effect of preach the gospel and be forgotten. And his point was, you glorify the Lord with your life. You point people to Jesus with your life. This life isn't about you. It's about the one who created it. And the best thing you can do is to point others to him. So preach the gospel and be forgotten. Now, these first 11 verses are quite depressing, okay? He's saying life has no purpose. From a human perspective, that's true. Uh, if you're a skeptic, if you're an atheist, you, you can't say life has an ultimate purpose. It might have some uh, subjective purposes, but there's no objective purpose to your life. And that ultimately is a sad, sad thing. And so... How does this end for Solomon? Is there a better way of looking at this? Is the Christian way uh, different? And I would say, yes, yes, it is. If you're reading, if you read through Ecclesiastes, you get to chapter 12, you can kind of see the conclusion. I know he starts with the conclusion of, hey, everything's vanity here. If you're going to try to find fulfillment in the pursuit of this life, of the, these things, these earthly things, and he's not saying they're inherently bad, nothing inherently bad about money and that kind of stuff. Um, those things are, are good, but they can you know, quickly become bad things, depending on how we treat them. Ecclesiastes 12, he says, remember your creator. He's giving advice. Okay, it's like this is the last information he wants to give to this young whippersnapper who's reading this. And he says, so remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of adversity come. And the years approach when you will say, I have no delight in them. If there's any advice to our young people I could give you today, do not forget the Lord as you grow. And you're going to be tempted to, to maybe not treat this as important as it should be. And you might have, you know, there's plenty of testimonies where folks say, I walked away from this, but I'm backed. 
back to this. And, and we're grateful for those testimonies of people who walked away, maybe when they were younger, and then they came back. We're grateful for that. But if you ask those people, they would tell you, I wish I would have never walked away to begin with. I would have been consistent in my faith, consistent in serving the Lord. Those ages, between 18 and 25, you're going to make some of the largest, most impactful decisions of your life are going to happen between 18 and 25 for most people. And for many folks, 18 to 25, <laughs> that's when they treat their faith as something I, I, I can do occasionally. It takes a back seat. And it's easy to do because... I mean, you're, you're not in high school anymore. You're an adult. Life comes at you very fast. It speeds up a lot quicker. There's a reason all of us older folks say, man, I wish I was back in school. Life was a lot easier. It was a lot simpler then. Why? Because life comes at you fast. My friend, keep the Lord number one throughout all of that. You will not regret it. You won't. And I love how Solomon lays this out. Like, listen, remember your creator in the days of your youth. The days of adversity, they're going to come. It is a reality for everyone. Hard days are going to come. And how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to deal with that with your faith or without your faith? He continues. So he says, hey, continue to seek the Lord. Verse 13 in Ecclesiastes 12. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. So he's like, man, if you can take anything away, if you can listen to anything I have to say, he just goes through 12 chapters here and he's like, just listen to this. So just wrap it up for you. Fear God and keep his commands because this is for all humanity. He tried to find fulfillment in every aspect of life. He couldn't find it apart from God. And so his conclusion is fear God, okay? What do we talk about when we talk about fearing God? It, you should have a reverential, holy fear of God Almighty. Fear can be a good thing. Now, now maybe the, the household you grew up in was a fearful household, and you're thinking, I don't want to have that kind of fear again. That type of fear, if you were in an abusive situation, this is not what we're talking about where you don't, you don't know what's going to happen the next second and you're, you're, you're cowering in the corner out of, you know, being scared, being fearful. This is not the type of fear God wants us to have. He wants it to be a reverential fear. What do I mean by that? My brothers and I are grateful to have good parents. And we had a reverential fear of them. Had a reverential fear of my dad. It wasn't that, that my, dad abused, my dad never abused us. Always tells us he loves us. But if you disobeyed, there were consequences for that. When my dad would get home from work, it was not an anxious presence for us at all. The only time it was an anxious presence for us was if you hadn't done your chores. Because we got home from school, like at 2.30 or 3, I don't remember, and then my dad was home about an hour afterwards. And typically I would go, I would get a snack, I'd fall asleep on the couch. My dad would pull in the driveway. The way the cars pull in the driveway, the, the light on the, the sunlight on the ceiling in our living room would like, there'd be some movement there. And you would know a car is pulled in the driveway. And that was my cue. Get up and get to work. Now you're probably thinking, well, Brent, why did you wait until he pulled in the driveway? I don't know. I was lazy. But he'd pull in the driveway. As long as I had started my chores, I was good. But if I hadn't done them, there's consequences for that. There was a reverential fear of him, a respectful fear. God is God and I am not. God is bigger than I am. He is the creator of all of this. And you know, in Hebrews 12, it says God chastises who he loves. Chastisement means punishment. He chastises us. And maybe you're dealing with that chastisement right now. Not, not every situation, hard situation we have in this life is because of God's chastisement. Sometimes it's because we, just, we live in a fallen world. But there are other times where, yeah, God may be correcting you 
And you better pay attention to what he's saying and how he's dealing with you. And when you read Hebrews 12, it's a grateful thing. You are thankful for the chastisement of God. It says in that chapter, no chastisement seems enjoyable at the time, but it yields a peaceable fruit. When you see a child who lacks discipline, we don't deem that a good thing. It's not loving to let a child do whatever they want to do. There has to be discipline in there, right? I mean, I know in this room, you guys could probably tell stories of times you had to get in, in, in trouble, get a spanking, as we call it. If you've never had to go across the street and cut your own switch, man, you are blessed. Been there, done that. And I know there's different modes of punishment, okay? I get that. My parents believe you spare the rod, spoil the child. But, you know, looking back on it, I'm grateful for that chastisement. So if there's any advice I could give you, it would be what Solomon say. Fear the Lord, that's one, and then do what he says. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things I say? You call me your Lord, but you don't listen to me. It's almost like he's saying, don't call me that. If you're not going to listen to me, don't call me that. And if you view the commands of God, Scripture tells us the commands of God are not grievous, meaning they're not burdensome. They're boundaries, but boundaries can be healthy. There's freedom within the boundaries. We've talked about that before. Guardrails are great. Keeps you from going over a cliff. God has boundaries for us. He has a way you should operate in this life. So many people have a pursuit that is not God. Therefore, they don't have the proper structure they need. Not in this life. That's why Jesus calls them sheep without a shepherd. So continue to seek the Lord. Fear him and do what he says. Circling back to John chapter 8. Jesus draws this line in the sand. He wants these people to believe that he is who he claims to be. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is for, to save their souls, to give them purpose, all of the above, because he is who he claims to be. So he draws this line in the sand. He says, if you believe me, you'll not die in your sins. If you don't believe me, you will. It's, it's black and white. My friend, you will not regret putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It doesn't just save your soul. It saves your life. It doesn't just change your life. It changes your eternity. Nobody can make you believe that. All we can do is share the truth. Jesus says the truth, that's what sets you free. Let's pray. Thank you for your time. I know these first 11 verses were a bit depressing, but it gives us perspective on this life apart from God. It is a futile life. And this quick moment that we have, my friend, your purpose is not pleasure. Your purpose is not power. Your purpose is not fulfilling any desire that you have. I'm not saying all of our desires are bad, but the purpose for which we live is to know God to make him known. Listen to Solomon. Fear God. Do what he says. So Christian, if maybe you have um, not been listening to what God is telling you to do, today would be a good day to, to confess and talk to him about that. You can do that during this time. And this is one of the reasons we're going to start doing our communion each week as a time of confession, a time of self-examination. And I don't know about you, but I need that every week. I need that time. And I don't say these things to scare anybody, and we're not trying to, to manipulate anyone into making any decision, but I, we share these things because it's the truth, my friend. If you don't know Christ, you die separated from him, you stay separated from him. The Bible calls that a hell. Jesus was very blunt in his approach with this. The reason he's so forward about it is because of what's at stake. So my friend, I would encourage you, I challenge you, if you're not a follower of Christ, 
one, become one. Repent and believe the gospel. Reach out to the Lord today in the, the, the quietness of this moment. You can pray to the Lord. <laughs> Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you're not convinced. And we get that. We were all there at some point. And uh, I'd love to help you with that. So I'll be hanging out after service. If you'd like to talk or you'd like to set up an appointment of some sort, we'd I'd love to talk to you. Pastor Brandon would love to talk to you and help you with that. Almighty God, I thank you for our time together this morning. I thank you for, I thank you for how, how Jesus is, is very upfront in his approach in our text. Lord, we don't want people to die in their sins. We know that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so I pray for those, Lord, who may be ready to make a decision for Christ, that they would reach out to you today. Pray to receive you, God, to turn from their sin, to trust in the Holy Son of God who died for their sin and resurrected the third day. Pray for those who are dealing with questions, Lord. I pray that they don't <clears throat> just leave those questions here. But they do something with them. They investigate them. They look into them. And we're, we, of course, are happy to help in that. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe today's a reminder for us. You know, the enemy would love to get us off of our purpose. So may we fear you, Lord, with healthy, reverential fear and do what you say. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand. We'll sing before we're dismissed. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. An heir of salvation, purchase of Are dismissed. We'll see you next week.